And I believe Scott is going to come and read our, our scripture for us this morning. Our scripture reading is in Matthew chapter 20. Uh, a little bit of a lengthier portion this morning. Um, so if you need to stretch your legs, go for it. But we're going to read Matthew 20, verses 1 through 28. Starting at verse 1. For the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And going out about a third hour, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace and said to them, You go into the vineyard too, and whatever is right I will give you. So they went. Going out again about the sixth hour and the ninth hour, he did the same. And about the eleventh hour, he went out and found others standing, and he said to them, Why do you stand there idle all day? They said to him, Because no one has hired us. He said to them, You go into the vineyard too. And when the evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, Call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last up to the first. And with, when those hired about the eleventh hour came, each of them received a denarius. Now when those hired first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received a denarius. And on receiving it, they grumbled at the master of the house, saying, These last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last worker as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or do you begrudge my generosity? So the last will be first and the first will be last. And as Jesus was going up to Jerusalem, he took the twelve disciples aside, and on the way he said to them, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified, and he will be raised up on the third day. Then the mother of the sons of Zebedee came up to him with her sons, and kneeling before him, she asked him for something. And he said to her, What do you want? She said to him, Say that these two sons of mine are to sit one at your right hand and one at your left in your kingdom. Jesus answered, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I am to drink? They said to him, we are able. He said to them, You will drink my cup, but to sit at my right hand and at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared by my father. And when the ten heard it, they were indignant at the two brothers. But Jesus called them to him and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be your slave, even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Thanks. You may be seated. Some sorry somewhere in the uh, uh, setting up for the worship team and everything. I don't know where I place my Bible. It's probably under on one of you all's chairs, but I don't know. But anyway, so I'm gonna have to look on my app this morning. All right. Okay. Well, welcome. Uh, if you've been here throughout the summer, you know that uh, we are looking. Or some of we're breaking with our normal habit of working our way through just a book of the Bible. We'll pick that up again here in a couple of weeks when we dive back into the second half of the Book of Revelation. Uh, but for the summer, we've been taking a look at difficult questions uh, that people largely on the outside or outside of the church in a broader culture have with relation to Christianity. Often that these, these questions that often serve as barriers or hindrances to them giving of themselves in faith to Jesus or for participation in his church. Right? And I'll remind you all that, you know, we're doing this 
not just to amuse ourselves with fun cultural debates, you know, everybody likes to do these days and debate this, that, and the other. Right, we're doing this partly because we want this to be a genuinely a safe and acceptable place where people who have questions can come and ask those questions and generally wrestle through how the Bible or how Jesus himself would speak into those deep-seated questions Right, we're doing this because probably, if we're honest, some of us have wrestled with some of these questions, right? So we're, we're speaking to ourselves as well. But then as well, too, like our goal is just to keep these conversations in front of us so that you can be mindful and you can be prepared to give an answer for the hope that you have within you should anybody that you connect with or you work with or have family and friendships with would ever ask, you know? Okay? So that's why we're doing it. And, and today's question... It's kind of a doozy, at least in my mind it is. Um, it's one I've, I don't know if scared is the right word to put, but maybe just more nervous, right? This question of, isn't Christianity oppressive towards women? <laughs> right? And, I, and again, I, I don't know if some of the nerves about this question, well, okay, or let me, let me first let me clarify the question. Last year, actually, when we were doing our hard questions and good news uh, series, we looked at that question in relation to how the Bible talks about relationships in the home. Uh, and today we're more looking at that question in relation to how the Bible and the New Testament in particular talks about relations between men and women in the church. So maybe more specifically, the question is, hey, aren't those churches which exclude women from the position of elder, right, this position of leadership over the church, aren't those churches inherently by nature oppressive of women? Aren't they just going to be inherently more tilted towards the perspectives or the interests or the directions that men want to take the church? Does not naturally make it oppressive to women and their interests and their wisdom and their directions and all that, okay? So now, why that's a little bit of a nerve-wracking uh, question for me, uh, partly because we just happen to be one of those churches, uh, part of a denomination, part of a long-standing historical tradition that goes all the way back to the ancient church that does, in fact, believe that the scriptures seem to indicate that Jesus has asked men to step up into those positions of leadership and has reserved a spiritual endowment for, or the equipping uh, that is needed in those positions for men. Okay, so we don't have any women on our elder board. I'm a little nervous about it because I know that there is going to be a group of young teenage girls who, like they have in the past, are probably going to corner me after this service and ask me great questions that they have thought uh, very carefully about. Well, what about this? What about that? Right? So if you see me bolting out the side door after the sermon, that's part of the reason why. <laughs> Not looking at anybody in specific. <laughs> All right. Anyway, um, yeah, that whole back family needs to get control of their kids. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Uh, at any chance I can get to embarrass Jolene. It's, anyway, on we go. Why else am I slightly nervous about this? Slightly nervous about it, or maybe, or maybe part of the issue is that I myself am a father of three teenage daughters who uh, I consider, consider every bit as inherently capable, inherently trustworthy, and inherently beneficial for positions of leadership in our society and our culture than any man, Okay. Or maybe it's because institutions with male leadership uh, or, or, or male leadership is facing a reckoning in not only the broader culture, but also in the church these days as well, too. There have been a flurry of books, um, uh, articles, podcasts, resources that have come up in the past years just kind of exposing um, some of the major flaws and harm that has taken place under male leadership in in the evangelical church over the past few years, right? And so that's just something that uh, increasingly our culture is very mindful of. But maybe at the end of the day, just in thinking about it, like this to me often seems the issue, and, and maybe I just feel it this way, I don't know why, but it, it often seems the issue where we are most, at least of the questions we're looking at this summer, most going against the tide and the current of our broader culture. All right, our broader secular culture has no time of day, has no patience for, has no tolerance, certainly no love for any institutions that bar any people group, whether it's based on gender or whether it's based on race or whatever, that would bar any people group from a position of leadership, right? And so this is a deeply, 
if, whether it's ever been offensive to you. And if you've grown up in the church and have just benefited from leadership in the church and you've never even wrestled with this question, great, good for you. But the broader culture, this is deeply offensive to the broader culture, that any institution would bar a certain people group from positions of leadership, right? You know, and uh, I would just say here, you know, from the, right from the beginning, that the convictions I hold on this issue are solely based on the convictions of how I understand the scriptures. And I'm genuinely open. If anybody wants to show me where I'm wrong in my understanding of the scriptures, and <laughs> I see somebody nodding their head in the back. I won't name names there, but <laughs> if anybody wants to, uh, yeah, and, and this person knows. We've had some good conversations about this. So if anybody wants to show me where I'm wrong in my understanding of the scriptures, I'm very open to hearing that and having meaningful dialogue about that. Okay, caveats aside. So here's the goal for this morning. The goal is not to this morning talk about what the Bible has to say in relation to the question of men and women in leadership. That's not really my desire. My, my goal this morning is not to lay out the biblical case for male eldership and all that. That's a great question to have, and I'm more than happy to have that conversation anytime. The specific question, hear me, that I'm going after this morning is, okay, well, what about those churches like ours that are convicted that this is how Scripture lays us out, Jesus lays out his intentions for his church? Aren't those churches, with their male leadership, aren't they just by nature oppressive towards women? Okay, That's the question I'm going after. And I'm going to do that in three ways. Uh, I'm going to say, first of all, well, let's, let's ask the women that question. I'm going to say, second of all, let's ask the text specifically what it means, or let's ask the text what it has in mind when it talks about leadership in the church. And three, let's circle back around and ask the culture a similar question as well, too. Okay, so those are my three goals this morning. So first of all, to that question, aren't conservative evangelical churches with their male leadership, are they just naturally oppressive towards women? Well, first of all, I think the very first response to that, well, okay, that's a question that we should ask women. And we should ask the women in those churches, in those conservative evangelical churches or whatever. Those are questions that we should ask women around the world, throughout the global church, and we should ask women all throughout history. And the thing is, I don't even have to hesitate in this, that if you asked women that question, if you asked the majority of women around the world, if you asked the majority of women throughout history, are those churches oppressive towards women? The overwhelming response you would get is an emphatic no. If you look at the church throughout history, more often than not, it has been predominantly women. The church has always been a majority of women. Going back to its early days, in the ancient church, the church, by most estimates, was two-thirds women. And it was the women who were out in front leading the mission of the church and who were uh, converting their families and then converting their friends, who were then converting their families, right? Again, the church was two-thirds. There was something wildly appealing something wildly attractive about Jesus and the church to women. And it's even more astounding, uh, that fact is, when you consider that the Roman Empire itself was predominantly male. It was the exact opposite. Uh, and, and probably the reason for that was that males, men were more valued. All right, we talked about this a few weeks ago uh, in, in Roman society. Not only was abortion legal, uh, but infanticide was legal as well, too. So right after the child was born, you had a period of time where you could just discard the baby and it would die of natural causes and you would not be held liable for that, right? And so um, if you were a, a young family, a couple, and you were having a child, but you really didn't want the child, but abortion was a little bit too sketchy, maybe a little too dangerous, but you could just have the child and discard it. Or if you were, going, if you were pregnant and you had the baby, and you look at the baby and you're like, mm, I don't know about that, okay, you had the right to just discard the baby along the side of the road or in the trash heaps just outside of town. And here's the thing. Most often, the, the, the young children that were discarded were, guess who? They were young girls. Right? Because the men were more valued in Roman society. But it was the church that came along and scoured the trash heaps. We talked about this and brought these young, unwanted girls into the family. Again, maybe contributing to the, I don't know, the, the, the bigger proportions or whatever. But again, there was just something wildly attractive and appealing about the church and about Jesus in the ancient culture. It was that, and, and part of it was that they found in this church this much greater honor 
and this much greater dignity and this much greater privilege than they occupied in Roman society. Right? It was the church, for instance. Well, I'll say this. It wasn't Roman society that decided that women can do whatever they want with their bodies. Right? That, that would have been a laughable notion in the Roman Empire. Right? The, the bodies of women were solely for the pleasures of men in Roman society. It was the church that came along and outlawed, outlawed sexual abuse and began to change a whole culture along those lines. It was the church that was very anti-sexual enslavement, which was predominant throughout the Roman Empire. It was in the church that young girls had far more choice over who they married and when they got married. The average betrothal age in the Roman Empire was like 12. And half of your 12-year-old girls would actually be married already and would have to consummate that marriage. In the church, the average number was more up like to 18. And they had greater choice over who they married. Or if you were a widow in the church, you found more love and care and support in the church than you did in a broader society such that you didn't just have to run back out into the arms of another man in marriage so that you could be cared for. No, the church, your church family was fervent about caring for you as a widow, right? Which is all to say that, again, there was just this great appeal to women in the ancient church. Or even if you look at the church around the world today, uh, you find similar things. Like if you look in, in uh, the underground church in China, which is growing at significant rates. Uh, some estimates there uh, would say, yeah, in that underground church, again, it's two-thirds women. <laughs> or if you look at the church in Iran, or you look at the church in a lot of these places where it's suffering real harm and persecution, there is a predominant presence of women, and women are often leading the mission efforts of this, right? So even just around the world today, if you ask the question to women, are these churches oppressive? For you say, actually, no. We have found something wildly affirming, wildly dignifying, enriching about these churches. And you could come back and say, okay, yeah, I get that. Okay, but the, but the examples that you're giving are kind of some repressive regimes there, right? We're talking about the Roman Empire with its repressive ethics. We're talking about China or Iran with its historical, you know, uh, derelegation of women, right? So the bar is set kind of low there for this church that you're talking about. But we in American society, we have a, a longer histor historical trajectory of valuing women's rights. And we've had more time to be accustomed to this equal worth of women in society. And so to us, the church looks oppressive. And okay, I hear that. It's a fair point. But I would probably even come back to this and say, yeah, well, okay. But where did we get that as Americans? Where as Americans did we get this interest in equal human rights for men and women? Where did that come from? Where do you think that came from? And by and large, you find that the question, the answer comes from the church. You back at the 1920s, first wave feminism, uh, that was successful largely because of the demonstrations and the protests and the activism of the Christian church and the feminists who were out in front leading because of their Christian convictions, right? Or Sojourner Truth, like right? who would stand up for the rights of African-American women, right? She would often do that appealing to Jesus and who he was and his truth in the New Testament. Okay, so anyway... Um, Simple way to put it, if you ask that question to women in the church, historically, around the world, even in American society, by and large, I think you'll find the answer, no, that's not to say that the men have done it perfectly or that there hasn't been abuse done, but by and large, the answer would come back, no. Second question. Let's see what the text has to say, um, in particular about this business of leadership. And, and to go with this, we could have looked at a lot of different passages. It shows Matthew 20. Because there's two great stories in here. Uh, this first story is of these disgruntled workers in the field. Actually, a couple weeks ago, uh, we had a windstorm. Some trees fell down in the Sauvé's backyard, massive trees. Uh, it was a sm small group of us that went over there to help make a small <laughs> dent in the cleanup operation. Uh, I, and I was part of that. Uh, but the thing was, I came late. It was about an hour late to this operation. And John Schmidt was there, and he'd been there the whole time. And the thing was, right, I got there just as they were taking a break for coffee and donuts. And 
And I was offered coffee and donuts, and John Schmidt was incensed. How dare this guy come in an hour and right before and receive coffee and donuts? And see, John's not here. He's traveling back from New York this morning, so I can say whatever I want, and he can't defend it. And if anybody here knows John Schmidt, you know that is the furthest thing from the truth. Actually, what he said, well, isn't this an interesting example of a biblical parable that we have in the book of Matthew? <laughs> and I said, you're right, it is. I'm going to have to bring it up sometime. <laughs> but it's a similar situation, right? Jesus, he tells a story of, of a field worker who goes out and hires people at the beginning of the day and says, hey, I'll give you a denarius for a day's wage, uh, as a day's wage for work in my field. And they say, great, sign me up. And they go. And throughout the day, Jesus is in town or wherever he is, and he sees people standing idly. He says, hey, you want to come work in my field for a denarius? And they say, yeah, sure. So he brings them in. He does this all throughout the day, 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock, 5 o'clock, all the way to the 11th hour. This is no ordinary eight-hour workday, apparently, back then. But in the 11th hour, he goes back out into the streets and says, hey, anybody want to come work in my field for a denarius for a day's wage? And he said, yeah, sure. And he brings him in. 12th hour comes. Time to pay up. He starts with those who came in last. Gives him a denarius. Works his way back up. Guys who've been there all day are expecting, I'm going to get quite the payout here. And instead, he hands him a a denarius. And they're incensed. (laughs) Wait a minute. What do you mean? You just gave Daenerys to all these guys who showed up late, including the one who came at the 11th hour. You just gave coffee and donuts to these guys who show up whenever they want, apparently. We've been here all day, sweating under the heat of the sun, toiling in this all 12-hour day, and, and still we get a Daenerys. And Jesus says, yeah, that's what we agreed on. Take care of your day's pay and, and go. Well, Jesus didn't say that. The field worker says that. So here's the question. What in the world does this have to do with the business of women leadership in the church? Well, we're starting to lay this sort of foundation that kingdom operates on totally different norms and values. And as part of what these parables aimed at, these parables were always uh, examples of how the kingdom operated. That's why at the beginning of, the, of Matthew 20, the first verse says, Jesus said to them, the kingdom is like, and then he tells this story. So here's essentially what Jesus is saying, and there's well, we can't get into all the specifics, but the main thing, part of the main thing Jesus is saying here to this crowd is, look, the kingdom is not a meritocracy. Or the benefits, the privileges, the perks, the life, the joy, the blessings, whatever that you would get from the kingdom is not payout for your hard labor, your hard work, or your ingenuity or natural ability. It's something different. The perks, the privileges, the blessings of the kingdom are dispensed solely on the basis of the graciousness, the generosity, and the wisdom of the king himself. Right? And that was, that offended the sensibilities of those ancient workers. And I think, in a way, that would offend the sensibilities of modern life as well, too. Right? Because our whole modern way of life, it essentially, it is a functioning meritocracy, right? You get what you get out of life. You get all the perks, the privileges, the blessings, or whatever, based on, or as payout for the work you put in, or your natural ability, or, you know, the connections that you have in life, or maybe just the advantages that you've had in life, right? Maybe you've had parents who were able to pay for private tutors all through elementary school, and then were able to pay for Harvard law school or business school or whatever. You know, and here's the thing, right? There are increasing voices in our broader culture that are saying, yeah, you know, and there actually may be something oppressive about that. Like that whole meritocracy, this payout for hard work and ingenuity actually can be somewhat oppressive or that works well for the strong and for the insiders and those who have connections and those who've had certain advantages in life. Where it doesn't work so well is for those who are weak or those who are not as physically able or those who all through life have been on the outside and don't have those inner connections or those who have been disadvantaged in life. Actually, that meritocracy can be somewhat oppressive to that. And so here comes this, just this radically different kingdom where Jesus says, yeah, my kingdom is not about that. It's not pay out for how hard you work or how smart or ingenuity. Or how, it's solely based on the graciousness and the mercy of the king. Okay? All right, so there's a baseline sort of difference about the kingdom. But then let's keep going. The second story is where it gets really interesting. Uh, they're on this pathway to Jerusalem here. The disciples have been following Jesus for several years. 
and we're coming up on the triumphal entry, and some of the disciples are starting to get excited about this. Hey, this guy that we've been following for three years, who we have come to be convinced is the king, right? He's about to enter the royal city. This is where it's all going to go down. The king is about to take his rightful reign, his position of power. And so uh, there's this mother that's tagging along, mother of James and John, the sons of Zebedee. And she asked Jesus, hey, when you get into your kingdom and your reign, can you grant that my sons will sit on your left and right? Right, will have those positions of great prominence and leadership in your kingdom. And Jesus responds to her, and you get the idea that James and John are there because he's talking to them as well too. You don't know what you're asking for. And he says, do you think you can drink the cup that I'm about to drink? James and John, yeah, we can drink that cup. <laughs> Jesus says, ah, essentially, we'll see. But then what happens, there's this little, uh, this little tiff that breaks out between the rest of the disciples and James and John now, right? All these other disciples have been following Jesus for three years, have, been given, have given up home and family and, you know, whatever their business is to follow this king. How dare you guys lobby yourselves for these positions, you know? Who, what, you know, how it come, it would be, who are you that it would go to you and not go to us, essentially, and Jesus overhears this little tiff that's taking place between the disciples, and he enters into it, or he calls them to him, and he responds. And notice how he responds. He doesn't say, guys, come on. You know I love you all equally. You know you're all equally valuable to me, so whoever sits on my left or whoever sits on my right, it doesn't matter. You're all of equal status. And he doesn't do that. Did you pick that up? Instead... It's like he says, look, you guys, you don't understand what you're asking for, <laughs> right? Whoever would be great in the kingdom, occupy these positions of greatness, if you will, must first, be, or what will essentially become a servant. Diakonos is the Greek word there, right? That's where the word we get uh, from our word deacon. And so you could argue, who's greater in the church, the elders or the deacon? I don't know. It's probably not even a valid question to ask based on this text. But there it is, right? Whoever would be great should become diakonos, a deacon, in my kingdom. And whoever would be first should become doulos, slave, in my kingdom. All right? You pick up what he's saying. Look, you guys, you're thinking about this all wrong. You're thinking about this question of prominence and position and leadership the way the Greco-Roman society does. Right? Greco-Roman society was a very hierarchical society. You had your, your upper class, your elites. You had your middle class. You had your lower class, your peasant class. And at the very bottom, your servant and your slave class. And in a hierarchical society, right, your life always aimed up the chain. Right? Your life, wherever you found yourself on that chain, was always aimed at advancing the interests, the needs, the desires, the well-being of the people just above you in the chain, whether it was in the home or whether it was in the government or whether it was in the civil society. That's how a hierarchical society works. And so Jesus says, guys, you're thinking about this the way the Gentiles do. Right? You know the Gentiles. They lord it over their people, expecting that their people will serve their interests and their desires and whatever they, you know, they want out of life or whatever. That's not the way the kingdom works. The kingdom is totally inverted is such that those who are great are servant class. And those who are first are slave class. Right? Those who are first in the kingdom, literally, their lives literally now are aimed at not their interests and their well-being and their whatever, but their interest, their life now literally is aimed at the interest, the needs the well-being of those under their care, right? So you see what Jesus is saying here? Like, you guys, you're looking at this question of the kingdom and leadership all wrong, upside down. And so I almost feel like if Jesus entered into the, our conversation in this question, like something about this question, for whatever reason, sounds similar to me to the way the disciples are, are bantering here at this point, right? The question that we're essentially asking is it, okay, how is it that you men can assume leadership, right, when, you know, we've been as faithful to Jesus all along as you have, we've been as, as hard at work, at, and I feel like if Jesus came and said, hold on a second, I'm not sure you're thinking about the business of leadership in the, in the way that I am, 
right? This kingdom is a totally inverted kingdom. This kingdom flips the norms, the values, the methods, and the practices completely on its head such that to be great or to be a leader or to be at the left and the right of Jesus in this kingdom means that your life is a servant now. And your life is slave status. That your life now aims at the interests, the needs, and the well-being of those under your care. Right? You know, and the last thing I want to say about this is this isn't just a nice ethical principle that Jesus is floating out there. Do you pick it up? Like, Jesus says, and, and let me show you what I mean. Right? He closes our passage you know, he's been saying all along, the first shall be last, the last shall be first, and all this. And he says, look, even the Son of Man, myself, came not to be served, but to serve and to give my life entirely as a ransom for others. Right? Or you think of that little interlude that was in between the two stories where Jesus is telling his disciples, and they're still not getting it, still not clicking. He's telling his disciples, look, we're about to go into Jerusalem, and the Son of Man is going to be handed over to the scribes and Pharisees, and they will condemn him to death. And then they're going to hand him over to the Gentiles, and they're going to mock him, and they're going to flog him, and they're going to crucify him. And he's going to be raised on the third day, all for the sake of the people that he loves, the people that he came to serve. Jesus is willingly going into Jerusalem, handing himself over to the scribes and the Pharisees and the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified because this is what the kingdom is all about and this is what kingdom leadership is. It's giving your life entirely for the needs, for the well-being of those who the Father loves, for those who Jesus calls my people, who he came to serve. Okay? All right? So first, we ask you know, the women, this very question, too. We ask the question of the text, what do we mean by leadership? And we make sure we're not talking about leadership the way Greco-Roman society would or the way our broader meritocratic society would talk about leadership. We talk about the way Jesus did and the way he lived it. And then third, you know, we kick this question back to culture. And I think what we would say, look, it is only this religious system that has, has this conviction that men and women are created in the image of God and this religious vision of a kingdom and of a king who gave his life entirely for the needs and for the well-being and for the redemption of his people, right? That kingdom leadership ethic, it's, it's only that system that can offer inherent worth and dignity and value and even rights to all people. It's not something that you're going to get from, I don't know, a secular, naturalistic, scientific worldview per se. I was reading Re Rebecca McLaughlin this week, um, and she points this out. Uh, you know, she talks about Peter Singer, uh, who's one of the more prominent uh, atheists, atheist writers, speakers in the world today. He's actually a, a professor of bioethics uh, at Princeton U University. And Peter Singer, he's... He's prominent for speaking uh, very eloquently about the reason why we should be uh, generous to the poor. Uh, he's also very uh, eloquent about why we should have stronger ethics for, for animals, for all creatures. Uh, and Peter Singer also is a prominent voice for the pro-abortion side of that whole debate. Uh, and part of the reason for that is Peter Singer, you know, we talked about this a couple of weeks ago when we were talking about the whole abortion issue and we talked about how in the broader culture uh, there's pretty much a, a common understanding. Yeah, that's hu human life in the womb, but it's not a human person yet. They make that distinction. And Peter Singer is one of those who's contributed into that whole line of, of reasoning and thinking, right? Uh, he would say, yeah, it's not a human person yet until it develops a certain self-consciousness or a certain rationality. And, and he would say that, look, value and rights are all based on, you know, these issues of capacities, right? So uh, a child in the womb that doesn't have this self-consciousness or doesn't have this inner sense of rationality, yeah, it doesn't have the same value or the same rights, you know, as a, as a full-grown adult, you know, whatever. Okay, and what's interesting is that Peter Singer is, is actually intellectually honest, and he would say, and, and you know, and, and look, let's be honest here, that... Do, that distinction doesn't just go away when we transfer from the womb to outside of the womb. 
<laughs> right? It's a matter of seconds here. And the same self-consciousness, the same sense of rationality is the same whether it's in the womb or outside of the womb. And so Peter Singer would come along and say, look, as a bioethicist, we're just, he's a naturalist. He would say, look, we are just, you know, mammals in the animal kingdom. And let's be honest, folks, there are a lot of animals out there that have a higher rationality, a higher sense of self-consciousness, greater capacity for this, that, and the other than a lot of newborn infants. And so Peter Singer famously would argue, based on naturalistic science, that, hey, there's no moral justification for doing away with the old Roman principle of infanticide. Right? In other words, just highlighting this point, that you don't get this idea of inherent human rights and human value and human dignity from natural science or just modern evolutionary, unguided evolutionary principles, right? And modern unguided evolutionary principles is just the survival of the fittest. Which is, which is all to say, you only find that in the system where people are endowed from the moment of conception with dignity as being created in the image of God. Or you only find it in this kingdom where the king is willfully laying down his life, saying that all people are worthy of me laying down my life for their interests, their needs, and their well beings. You don't find that in secular society. You certainly don't find that in Confucian th philosophy out over in China or whatever. In other words, you find what women around the world and women all throughout history have found that the most dignifying, the most honoring, the most right-giving worldview and perspective out there is the one that flows from this King Jesus. So I'm almost kicking the question, like I said here, back to secular culture, to you who are concerned and passionate about human right and the rights, equality of women. And like, like, what's your grounds for that? Where do you find basis to be so passionate about these rights and equal treatment? You don't find it. From secular scientific theory, you don't find it from Confucian theology or whatever. You find it solely in this biblical worldview. Where you find it most consistently, I would say, in Jesus Christ and the church and the kingdom that he starts. So ask the women, ask the passage itself what we're talking about when we talk about leadership. And then let's kick it back and say, where does this, this propensity for rights and dignity and worth come from? I don't know if you'll find it anywhere else. And this movement started by Jesus. So there's much more to be said here. And we haven't answered all the questions, certainly by any means. All I've hoped to do is kind of push the question back and to continue this conversation. I'd love to continue it, right? I haven't, I'm sure I'm going to get cornered by some of these teen girls. Yeah, but what about this? And what about that? And okay, and that's great. Let's continue the conversation. And I want to say a quick word to the leadership here, to the men in positions of leadership. Right? We certainly haven't answered all the questions here. And it is our responsibility to make sure that we are very faithfully and very regularly asking this question. Right? Because if it ever is the case that we are wrongfully barring people or people groups, right, we have to deal with that. Right? We hold this conviction that we're not. Great. But we, we never just become pride in that, proud in that. But... We regularly be answering and looking into this question. We regularly be talking to those who are wrestling with this question. Or maybe I would say it this way. If you're in leadership here and, and you haven't recently read a logical, well-reasoned, robust defense of the other side of this argument... Right? Maybe from church leaders in the Evangelical Presbyterian Church or maybe the Christian Reformed Church. If you haven't done that recently or in quite some time, let me strongly admonish you need to do that. Right? You need to do that. You need to understand where the other side is coming from, the questions. You need to be challenged in your own understanding of the text so that you can carefully consider everything and at the end of the day come back and say, Nope, I'm convinced that this is thus saith the Scriptures. Or you need to do that so you make sure that at the end of the day, there isn't a hint of old patriarchy that is influencing our reading of the text. Right, so it is good for us regularly to hear the arguments from the other side so that we can look at that, we can evaluate that, we can see where we think that that's not treating the text faithfully, and we can come back with an even stronger conviction. Right? So that's just a charge to our, our leadership here. But, again, the bigger point... 
if you find yourself resonating with this question, or if you know people that are resonating with quest this question, the challenge that I'm going to put back to you, the challenge that has been has affirmed historically, been affirmed by women around the world, that seems to be affirmed by the text over and over again, to be affirmed by the example of Jesus himself, is that if you want to find a system that values men and women, a system that upholds equality and rights and dignity and worth of men and women, the only time-tested historical example of that down through the ages is this movement that Jesus started. And so my hope for you, my hope and the prayer for the people that you would interact with is that you would run back to Jesus and you would be enamored by not only his glory, but by his demonstration of valuing people and their needs and their interests above his own such that he would lay down his life. And I pray that that would lead you to willingly entrust yourself anew to his scandalous leadership and his scandalous kingdom that doesn't fit in with the way the rest of the world works. And I pray that in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.